This paper is about conceptualizations of sacred text in early Latter-day Saint worldviews, and particularly the ways those conceptualizations drew from then contemporary theories of accommodationism, and also how they were employed to structure power related to the authority of the prophet Joseph Smith. In this paper, I employ insights from the fields of social memory and cognitive linguistics that hold first that texts have no inherent meaning, but are given meaning as interpretive lenses are applied by readers. And second, that a faith community's interpretive lenses are formed through an ongoing process of renegotiation between the community's sacred past and the needs and exigencies of the present. The main documents with which I'll be engaging are the Council of 50 Minutes, the various manuscripts associated with the, Bi the prophet's revision of the Bible, and the early manuscripts and editions of the Book of Commandments and the Doctrine and Covenants. These early versions of these texts provide additional historical insight that is absent from contemporary Latter-day Saint engagement with sacred texts. I will argue that, much like today, early Latter-day Saint conceptualizations of sacred texts were entangled with the structuring of power and values, and particularly with defending the authority of the prophet. The context and the precise rhetorical exigencies of the early church were quite distinct from those of today, however, and so resulted in different understandings of the nature and function of sacred texts. On April 18, 1844, the Council of Fifty read a draft of a proposed constitution for the kingdom of God, which was patterned in many ways after the United States Constitution. Following the reading, Elder John Taylor expressed the concern that any such constitution would only be adequate if it came directly from God. Addressing the prophet Joseph Smith, Elder Taylor stated, we have a portion of the spirit, but if we get the document anywhere right, it will be because God gives it. And if not, we know nothing but what either you or God teaches us. After Elder Erastus Snow and the prophet identified a problematic statement in the Constitution, Elder Taylor urged the committee to find all the cracks they can in the draft and expose them. Elder Brigham Young then addressed the committee, stating he had no fears, but God would organize the kingdom right, and what he has seen in this assembly was nothing more than what he had looked for. Ultimately, however, even revelation would not be enough. It would have to be God who perfected any such constitution because there has not yet been a perfect revelation given because we cannot understand it, yet we receive a little here and a little there. In other words, even revelation was given in order to meet contemporary circumstances and not to transcend the discrete historical context and remain in force in perpetuity. Elder Young did not believe we can adopt laws for the government of people in futurity. We can, for the time being, point out laws for present necessities. Then Elder Young said that he should not be stumbled if the prophet should translate the Bible 40,000 times over, and yet it should be different in some places every time. Because when God speaks, he always speaks according to the capacity of the people. Here Brigham Young is promoting a brand of what is known as accommodationism. This is the view that God accommodates or adapts himself, his gospel, and his messages to the capacities and conventions of his audience so that the audience can comprehend. The concept is found beginning in early Christianity in the late second century, as Christian apologists were adapting the gospel to Greco-Roman philosophical and intellectual frameworks. In short, they needed to make the gospel philosophically defensible. Folks like Justin Martyr, Origen, and John Chrysostom promoted accommodationist perspectives regarding the gospel and God's self-revelation. When we get to the Reformation and after, we see accommodationism most clearly and directly applied to the nature of Scripture. This is primarily in reaction to concerns with the accuracy of Scripture that had arisen as a result of the scientific progress of the Renaissance, the Reformation's centering of Scripture, and the rise of rationalism in the Enlightenment. For example, the statement in Genesis 1.16 that God made two great lights to rule the day and the night obviously refers to the sun and the moon. But astronomers in John Calvin's day calculated Saturn to be larger than the moon, rendering Genesis 1.16, for some folks at that time, of dubious scientific accuracy. In response, Calvin deployed the concept of accommodation to argue that Moses adapts his discourse to common usage and only proposes things which lie open before our eyes. By the 19th century, the majority of these accommodationist concerns orbited around the creation and around the authority and historical accuracy of scripture, and particularly as a result of deist and other rationalist criticisms. Brigham Young's quote regarding the translation of the Bible highlights the early Mormon deployment of a brand of accommodationism in the defense of the prophetic authority of Joseph Smith. 
The comment about translating the Bible 40,000 times may have reference to the fact that at at least two places, the prophet seems to have inadvertently translated the passages from the Bible twice and in very different ways. The more significant of these two retranslations is Matthew 26. Joseph Smith's New Testament manuscript 1 included Matthew 26 verses 1 to 71, But when John Whitmer transcribed that text, which ends in this image, onto new manuscript pages, his transcription, for some reason, stopped halfway through the very first verse of Matthew 26. When Joseph Smith returned to the project, he appears to have forgotten that he had already translated this chapter, and three blank manuscript pages after Whitmer's transcription of verse 1 proceeded to retranslate all of Matthew 26, with many insignificant differences from the first draft. So for Brigham Young, these different renderings, easily perceived to be errors arising from human imperfection, are neither a surprise nor a concern since Revelation has received precept by precept to address contemporary exigencies and in a way that is accommodated to contemporary capacities and conventions. This approach harmonizes with Joseph Smith's own thoughts on the matter, which seem at least in part to have derived from his argument for the necessity of a living prophet in light of the Bible's insufficiency to address contemporary circumstances, which stands directly opposed to the Protestant doctrine of biblical sufficiency. In an 1833 letter to his uncle Silas, the prophet wrote, you will admit that the word spoken to Noah was not sufficient for Abraham. Isaac, the promised seed, was not required to rest his hope upon the promises made to his father Abraham, but was privileged with the assurance of God's approbation in the sight of heaven by the direct voice of the Lord to him. In other words, the circumstances, perspectives, and needs of each generation demand the word of God be customized, which requires continuing revelation. This is a framework for the necessity of prophetic authority that can also account for changing perspectives and circumstances in a way that protects that authority from accusations of error. I'd like to address one specific example of how this concern for protecting authority can sometimes obscure our ability to discern the word spoken to us today. One of the clearest articulations of accommodationism in Latter-day Saint scripture comes from the Book of Commandments 1 verse 5, now D&C 1 verse 24, which reads, These commandments are of me, and were given unto my servants in their weakness after the manner of their language, that they might come to understanding. This is a pretty clear statement that the imperfections of whatever commandments are being addressed do not necessarily undermine their divine origin, but are a product of God's condescension or accommodation and are given in recognition of the inevitability of human error on the part of those who receive them. But there's more to this statement. What commandments precisely are being referenced? The verses that come before and after provide a fuller picture. The previous verses state that the Lord gave commandments to Joseph Smith Jr. and also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things unto the world, and all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. It goes on to paraphrase 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 and 28, which in part represent what was written by the prophets, namely, the weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. Each clause in the rest of the verse that begins with the phrase that further fleshes out the purpose of proclaiming these things unto the world. That man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of the flesh. That every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. That faith also might increase in the earth. That mine everlasting covenant might be established. That the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. The commandments referenced in verse 5 are all the commandments and commissions given to Joseph Smith and to all others who help publish and proclaim the gospel. In other words, the contents of the Book of Commandments. Verse 5 thus deploys accommodationism to defend the human frailties of the Book of Commandments. This fits with what we know about the publication of the Book of Commandments. Its first chapter was received in response to concerns that the publication left the church open to criticism in light of the perception of imperfections in a text purporting to be God's own revealed will. Verse 5 is using accommodationism to defend the inspiration of the revelations that were to be published, and to defend the prophetic authority of Joseph Smith. This did not tamp down all the concerns, at least not for William McClellan, and another revelation followed immediately after. Originally published at section 25 in the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, now section 67. The Lord tells the gathered elders that there were fears in your hearts, and that your eyes have been upon my servant Joseph Smith Jr., and his language you have known, and his imperfections you have known. 
The elders are then challenged to try to reproduce commandments equivalent to those found in the Book of Commandments. Returning to the Book of Commandments, the rest of verse 5, following the appeal to accommodationism, represents a long and complex run-on sentence that fleshes out why God gave these accommodated commandments unto my servants in their weakness. The list culminates with the statement that these commandments were given so that those to whom they were given might have power to lay the foundation of this church and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness. Again, the Lord's purposes are focused on the establishment of the church through the work of Joseph Smith and through the efforts of all those sent forth by commandments. <clears throat> so what part of this is sometimes obscured by the need we feel to protect prophetic authority? The middle of verse 7, today DNC 138, states, And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled. Whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Most of us are used to hearing this verse deployed to identify the voice of God as isometric with the voice of my servants, which has traditionally been understood to refer to God's prophets and apostles. In this way, the passage serves to clearly delineate the words of the prophets and apostles as the very words of God himself. Sacred text, according to this reading, is the very mind and will of God. This interpretation stretches back to the early years of the church. In 1854, Heber C. Kimball paraphrased this passage when he wrote that his only desire had been to do what I am counseled. It matters not to me whether it be by the voice of God or by the voice of his servants, it is all the same with me. Then Elder Wilford Woodruff wrote in 1878, the Lord taught us in a modern revelation contained in this book, the Doctrine and Covenants, that it matters not whether he speaks from heaven by his own voice or by the ministration of angels or by the mouth of his servants when they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost, it is all the same. Note the harmonization here of our statement from Book of Commandments 1.6 with the statement in DNC 22.1, now 68.4. Whatsoever they shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be scripture, shall be the will of the Lord, shall be the mind of the Lord, shall be the word of the Lord, shall be the voice of the Lord and the power of God unto salvation. These passages in DNC 1 and 68 <clears throat> have traditionally been understood to refer to God speaking through the church's central leadership and primarily the prophets and apostles. In a 2016 general conference address, Bishop Waddell quoted DNC 138 and then continued, from the days of Adam down through the ages to our current prophet, Thomas Spencer Monson, the Lord has spoken through his authorized representatives. Those who choose to listen and give heed to the words of the Lord as delivered through his prophets will find safety and peace. The most common use of this verse by leaders of the church is to equate the voice of the leadership with the Lord's own voice, asserting the unassailable authority of the church's central leadership. But there are other readings that have been promoted. In a 2018 address, President Henry B. Eyring suggests that we might all be able to speak for the Lord. Speaking for him requires a prayer of faith. It takes a fervent prayer to Heavenly Father to learn what words we can speak to help the Savior in his work. We must qualify for the promise whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Indeed, in both Book of Commandments 1 and DNC 22, the reference is very clearly to a much wider set of individuals than just the church's central leadership. In DNC 22.1, the antecedent of they in the phrase whatsoever they shall speak is all those who were ordained unto this priesthood whose mission is appointed unto them to go forth. In other words, all those ordained and given a commission to go forth on the Lord's errand will be able to speak the will, mind, word, and voice of the Lord when so moved upon by the Holy Ghost. This is an important qualification. Now, the concept is the same as in Book of Commandments 1, where the phrase, my servants, refers to anyone given a commission by God. Verse 3 distinguishes the Lord's servants from the prophets and apostles. The day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord Neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. At most, the prophets and apostles are a subset of my servants. But the Doctrine and Covenants consistently presents my servants as a broad designation for anyone sent forth on the Lord's errand. But with Book of Commandments 1-7, DNC 138, we frequently see that understanding narrowed specifically to church leadership in order to equate that leadership with the very mind and will of God. But there is another critical way we narrow our reading of this passage in order to serve our structuring of power related to prophetic authority. The focus of Book of Commandments 1 is establishing that God gave these commandments to people in their weakness so that they might come to understanding. This accommodationist response was intended to address concerns that the texts were historically situated 
and had imperfections in them and therefore could not represent the voice of the Lord. It seems odd to conclude such a revelation by asserting that the voice of those weak and imperfect people is the very voice of God himself, especially in uh, absence of the qualification regarding being moved by the Holy Ghost. There is a simpler reading. What is the same is not the voice of God and the voice of his servants. What is the same is that the word will be fulfilled. Here is Brigham Young referring to this verse in 1871. It is no matter whether he speaks by his own voice or by the voice of an angel or through his faithful servants here on the earth, all the words of the Lord Almighty will certainly be fulfilled. So a paraphrased reading that corresponds to President Young's is basically this. My word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled. Whether that word comes by my own voice or by the voice of my servants, that word is fulfilled all the same. Instead of saying that word is the same word, whether it's by God's voice or by that of his servants, President Young says the word is fulfilled, whether that word is delivered by God's own voice or by the voice of his servants. Now, I would suggest we can parse this sentence even further. That word whether introduces two means by which uh, one of which some circumstance is obtained. Something is achieved either by my own voice or by the voice of my servants. President Young's reading infers that it is the delivery of God's word that is achieved. But there is an explicit antecedent that I would argue more clearly supports the rhetorical goals of the rest of the section. What immediately precedes the word weather is the statement that God's word shall all be fulfilled. This is the most natural antecedent for the circumstances that attain. According to this reading, a paraphrase would be, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether it is fulfilled by mine own voice or fulfilled by the voice of my servants. It is fulfilled all the same. So this raises the question of how God's word can be fulfilled by the voice of his servants. We would expect the servants' actions to fulfill God's word, not their voice. But verse 4 suggests it is precisely the proclamation of the gospel unto the world that fulfills what was written by the prophets. These prophecies are all entirely or primarily achieved by the voice of God's servants proclaiming the gospel. This reading far better fits the context of the rest of the Book of Commandments 1, as the rhetorical goal of the section is precisely to defend the imperfection of those voices. The conclusion is thus that it doesn't matter if God's word is fulfilled by the voices of imperfect humans, such as Joseph Smith, or by the very voice of the Lord himself, since the word is fulfilled all the same. The inspiration of the Book of Commandments should not be assessed by the perfection of its language, but by whether or not the messages are fulfilled. This shifts the scrutiny of the prophet's authority away from the perfection of his literary abilities and onto the future fulfillment of his prophecies. This revelation was received during a period of the church and the prophet's relative vulnerability. Now, the church is now on a much firmer foundation and is not actively publishing new scripture, so the need is no longer salient for church leaders to defend human imperfections in those scriptures. The rhetorical exigencies and therefore the interpretive lenses have shifted to protecting prophetic authority through reading DNC 138 as a declaration of the isometry of the prophet's voice and that of the Lord. Sacred texts are commonly entangled with questions of structuring values and power. This is really an inevitability. Like all texts, sacred texts have no inherent meaning. Meaning is constructed exclusively in the minds of readers, and the interpretive lenses we bring to the texts determine the meanings we are able to construct for them. For a community of faith and their leaders, the most powerful interpretive lenses are related to their shared social identity, and particularly their shared sacred past and their shared needs and goals today. Our engagement with scripture and our production and transmission of doctrine is an ongoing process of renegotiation between that shared sacred past and the needs and goals of our shared present. That process cannot be divorced from interpretive lenses related to the structure, structuring of power and values. Thank you for your time.